So the big question is this, how are real estate investors who don't have a ton of free time, don't have access to off-market deals, and didn't start life on third base? How do we grow a real estate business conservatively to support our families, finally leave the corporate rat race, and build a legacy? That is the question, and this podcast will give you the answers. I'm Ed Matthews, and this is Real Estate Underground. This is the Real Estate Underground podcast show number 70. Greetings and salutations, Real Estate Undergrounders. This is Ed Matthews with the Real Estate Underground podcast. Uh, you know, one of the things that I'm always looking to do is learn more about uh, other asset classes. Yes, I'm a huge fan of uh, multifamily. That's not going to surprise anybody. But the fact is, is that, you know, there are other, multi I didn't know, you don't know, you know, I don't know if you know this, but there are actually other asset classes in this world to invest in. And uh, today we have um, uh, Joel Friedland uh, of Brit Properties, and he is and has been a syndicator in the industrial space for uh, quite some time. So Joel, welcome to the show. And thank you very much for your time today. It's good to see you. Thanks, Ed. It's great to see you. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, obviously there are multiple asset classes. And, you know, usually when I say, hey, do you diversify uh, the, the first thing someone said, you know, outside of multifamily, they say, oh yeah, I'm in self-storage. I was like, oh, okay, but what else? And then they, you know, they're like, what do you mean? What else? So industrial syndicators, you know, it's, it's a unique space. And I also think that the way that you approach the market in terms of leverage, in terms of how you manage risk, um, is really unique within our business. So, um, for those of us who haven't met you yet, um, why don't you talk about, uh, your business and who you are and how we got here, and then we'll get into we'll get into the other stuff. Sure. Um, well, when I was 14 years old, uh, my parents went on a vacation, and we lived in the suburbs. And I was feeling like um, it's it's hard to explain it, but we lived in a very fancy neighborhood. We had the smallest house, and we were not the wealthiest. We were the least wealthy people in the neighborhood. Right. So when I needed to uh, do things at age 14 and I'd say to my parents, hey, I need this, whatever, they'd say, well, you know, it's a lot of money. Right. So I decided while they were on vacation to start a landscaping business, it was April. And I went door to door in my neighborhood uh, and I ended up getting 70 families to agree to let me to do the landscaping. Wow. For their really? Home. Yeah. So 70 lawns is too many a week for me. So I hired my, at the time, junior middle school uh, right. buddy to cut lawns and trim bushes and all that. Right. And the next year I went out and I did more. My parents came home from the vacation and they said, why are there five lawnmowers in our garage? Right. And I had gone to the lawnmower shop and I had bought all this equipment uh, on credit. So I built this business and I realized that uh, my thing wasn't sports. It was business. Yep. And I was, I was really good at selling. So when I graduated from the University of Michigan, I knew I wanted to yep. go into real estate. I, I knew I wanted to. I'm yep. a Wolverine. Yep. So uh, I found a family, not my family, but a family that owned an industrial real estate company. Okay. It was a father named Milt Podolsky and his two sons, Stephen, Randy, and daughter, Bonnie. They had 84 industrial buildings. They had a syndication business going back to the 1960s. Wow. Multi-million dollar family net worth. Yeah. And I cold called them and I said, I'm looking for a job. And Milt needed a property manager. So he said, can you come in today? And I went that day and right. I met him. And within a very short period of time, he said, you're not going into property management. If you got 70 lawns when you were 14, I have 10 empty buildings. It was 1981. Interest right. rates were 17%. Right. And he was suffering not having tenants for these vacant buildings. Yep. And I said, Milt, I can go door to door in an industrial park and I can pluck tenants out of neighboring buildings and convince them to move into your buildings. And that's what I did. Fantastic. And fell in love with it. Fell in love with the real estate business. I made 37 leases in my first year. Wow. And I was, woo, I was, woo -hoo. It, yeah. it was great. Right. And I was kind of on a natural high for 10 years. It was so much fun. 
Uh, the problem is that I realized that Milton and his family were as wealthy as they were, not because they were real estate brokers and agents, but because they owned all this property. Right. So I went to Milton. I said, hey, would you help me if I want to syndicate a deal? He said, you go find the deal. I'll put up 30% of the money, but you have to find the investors for the other 70%. And I did it and it worked. Wow. I did it again and it worked. And then we hit 1991, mm. which was a the, the Gulf War recession. Yeah. And I had some vacant properties and I fell into what I would call a clinical depression. Yeah. Because I thought that I had lost money for all of my investors. Yeah. It was really rough. Scary. Yeah, it was tough. Uh, Milt helped me through it and his kids helped me through it. And after a while, I, I recovered. And then I decided I needed to do more of it. And um, I asked if they would make me a partner in their family business. And they said, we, we just can't do that. We'll give you 5%. Yeah. But I wasn't a 5% kind of guy. And I said, right. I'm going to start my own business. And I did. And I built a business, both brokerage, industrial brokerage, yep. uh, and syndicating. Um, and only in the Chicago area. Chicago is a huge industrial market it's oh, got yeah. 1.3 billion square feet of industrial wow really 20,000 companies 8,000 buildings and my um my theory was that chicago's big enough that i can do all my deals here i don't have to go national or anything mm -hmm. like that mm -hmm. and i built up a really nice portfolio mm -hmm. and things were going great and then we hit 2008 and just like 1991, um, things went bad because the market cycles, it doesn't always go up. Right. Anyone who's been in the, the business since 2009 really hasn't seen this. Right. They're about I, to. They're, I think so. I think there's a bubble and it's going to pop. Yep. But um, that couch behind me, I was, I've told you this before. Yep. Uh, I was on the couch and I couldn't get off. Yeah. My family literally was watching me to make sure that I didn't go take pills in the bathroom. That that's how depressed I was. Wow. Because I thought, Sorry. yeah, it was really rough. I thought that I had lost the capital of about a hundred million dollars belonging to two hundred of my closest friends and investors. I eventually got off the couch and I went to work and I decided instead of going bankrupt, let's save this thing. Yeah. And we did. And I came to a conclusion, which is really interesting, different than I think anyone else uh, I know, which is I came to the conclusion that I was uh, compulsive gambling in real estate. And I think for me, my definition of gambling in real estate is having a lot of debt. Mm -hmm. So I made the decision to go 100% equity no mortgages on all my future deals. And that's what I do today. Wow. That is unique, right? Because, uh, you know, every every investor I know is all about managing leverage, right? Every single one. I, I don't know anyone other than you that that does it this way. I'm sure there are others, but. So, so what does that, what does that do for you? Um, let's talk about it at two levels. What does that do for me, for you as a, uh, as a, you know, running the business. And then also what does it do for you as a human being? Like psychologically, what does that do for you? Yeah. Uh, that's a great question. I believe that human beings, uh, are driven very often by their mood. Yes. I, I have something that I call my mood scale. Um, the depression I was in was at the very low end. I call that like a one on a scale of one to 10. Mm-hmm. But people are doing great and they're driving their fancy car because everything's gone right and they buy their yacht. That's sometimes where you get to the point where you think you can do no wrong. And I consider that on my scale to be like a 10. Yeah. The safety zone for me is four and a half to five and a half. That's where you, you're very stable in your mood. Right. Uh, it's, it's not where you feel like you're going to go out and set the world on fire you're going to pay attention to the details because the details are what matter. Yep. The math matters. Yes. The due diligence matters. And 
we do big deals. We buy buildings for $3 million, $5 million, $12 million. Yep. I, I cannot sleep at night if I have a lot of debt. And here's the big problem. We get great returns because we take some risk. Our risk is that we buy single tenant industrial buildings, one tenant. Okay. And there's a reason for that, which I can explain yep. having to do with, uh, we sell them eventually to users as opposed to selling them as an investment to another investor. So you sell it to the business owner itself, themselves. You do. And almost every time they're within walking distance or a few minutes driving distance from the building that we are selling to them. Yep. Because they can't lose their employees. In industrial, there's manufacturing. Right. The worst thing that can happen is your employees leave because you've trained them. And the other thing is in manufacturing buildings, the machines are, are big and they are bolted to the ground. And to move right. machines, is it's a huge job. Right. So um, that mood thing is really important because when you're in a steady mood, you do good due diligence. Yep. You think about the consequences and you figure out what the risks are and you're honest with yourself. You're not playing that game of, hey, I'm so great. Right. You're saying, you know what? I could lose. I, I've, I've, I've had two down cycles that put me on the couch and I don't want to be there again. Right. So here's what I figured out. I went to my accountant and I said, I'm going to do all cash deals because from a mental health standpoint, I just can't take a lot of risk with single tenant buildings, which means I, I can't really put much debt on. And he said, come on, no one's going to invest in a deal where there's no debt. Are you crazy? No one will do it. He said, put some, put 50% on. I said, if I was in the apartment business, if I did multifamily, I think I probably would do that. Yeah. Because if you have a hundred tenants and ten leave, you're still okay. That right, you're you fine. You're making any cash flow, but you're right. okay. Right. But with a building like ours, an industrial building, a thirty thousand foot building occupied by a manufacturer, our three biggest risks are vacancy, vacancy, and vacancy. Yep. If we own the building all cash and it's vacant, we can carry it for a very long time. Sure. So my investors. Um, didn't really know me as the the all cash guy. They knew me as the guy that would borrow 50, 60%. Yeah. And I told my accountant that I, I just had to try it. Yeah. And I did. And here's what I found out. The wealthiest people that I know, the, the very high level millionaires and billionaires. Yeah. Are not looking to get rich. They're already rich. Right. It's capital preservation for them, right? That's it. Capital preservation. Yep. And when I tell people that I do all cash deals, and if our buildings go vacant, there's no bank, they say, oh, I've never heard of that before. How much can I put in? Right. And then I have a problem, which is it's hard to find deals where you do them all cash, where the yield is high enough to make it worthwhile. <laughs> so right. so you have, average. you know, where where I'm always, you know, looking for and, and find, determining that there's a dearth of deals out there. Uh, you know, and, and capital, you're, you're, you're in the same struggle, right? You've got plenty of capital and, and not enough deals. Sounds like. It's never been harder to find a deal. Yeah. Um, I was hoping to buy 10 deals this year. I bought three and I was lucky to get the three. Yeah. Yeah. It's been really tough. Uh, the, the biggest issue is I'm competing with a different group than everybody else. I'm competing not only with investors, I'm competing with users because, if I'm buying a vacant industrial building that's um, a manufacturing building, the same company that I would sell to if I bought it might be in the market looking. And there, here's the thing. Users pay a 30 to 40% premium over what's paid by an investor. Right. That makes total sense, right? Because as you were saying earlier, you know, moving those machines, taking the risk of, of having employees decide that the commute's too long, or, you know, any other thing is, is you know, it's a Herculean at, um, effort to, to move a building, right? So it makes total sense that they're willing to overpay, you know, because they know they're going to be there for a while. So time will heal the the overpayment. And uh, yeah, that makes a lot of sense to me. Wow. Yeah, I'll give you a funny statistic. We, we have uh, 16 buildings, industrial buildings in our portfolio. And by the way, we do A and B buildings. Okay. I'm sorry, B and C buildings. We don't do okay. A buildings. 
Yeah. E buildings are those big warehouses that you see on the side of the highway that Amazon is in. Right. Those are institutional. My people and I do the B and C, which are smaller and older. Yep. But nobody's building any more of them. So they're very hard to come uh, right. to, um, into. So the the thing that, that happens is my tenants renew. They don't want to leave. Sure. So here's my statistic. I've looked at this recently. Out of 16 buildings, 15 of them, the tenants have renewed more than one time. Really? They sign four or five, six and seven year leases, and then they renew for three to five years usually. Wow. So they just don't want to leave. Sure. And that's why we own long term because we keep collecting the rent. Our um, our target cash flow yield is 8%. Okay. It's very hard to get. Chicago is easier because Chicago has higher yields than mm -hmm. the coasts. New York, New Jersey, much lower. California, right. much lower. But in the Midwest and in Chicago, because it's the, the big monster city, yeah. there's a lot of volume. There's a, a lot of uh, product. There's a lot of tenants. But I can find deals from time to time that do give 8% cash flow with annual increases so that over a 10-year period, it might average 9.5% or 10%. That's, that's un unleveraged. For, for a capital preservation play, that's pretty darn good. It is. But it's really hard to find them. Yeah, yeah. So, so let me ask you something. You know, the world changed COVID, right? The world changed, and you know, one of the things that we discovered is that manufacturing things in the Pacific Rim is way more risky than we thought it was. And so, you know, going from pharmaceuticals to semiconductors to everything in between, you know, and obviously there's now a push to move manufacturing. Uh, I don't think wholesale, but at least a sizable chunk of it back to the U.S. You know, how is that going to affect your business? So that's called reshoring, and it's happening in every industrial market. Yep. And it's affecting our business in that uh, the very large developers who are backed by pension funds and insurance companies are building millions of square feet of new industrial buildings. Yeah. And most of the large companies like those kinds of buildings. But the B and C stuff that we own is also highly sought after by smaller divisions of large companies. Right. Okay. By entrepreneurial companies. Listen to this one. I have one tenant that was on Shark Tank year one who makes uh, protein bars. Okay. And he's in 50,000 feet. First year, the first year of Shark Tank. Kevin and Robert said, this is the best negotiator we've ever seen. Well, it was the first year. So that's why right. it was in the first year. Yeah. It was Jonathan Miller and this element bars uh, is in one of our buildings. He couldn't find a building to buy because it's so hard. So he had to end up leasing and he met me and he leased our building. Okay. Uh, he went from 50,000 in revenue to $12 million over the past 14 years. Wow. Good for yeah. him. Yeah. And the most recent deal we signed was with a guy who was on Undercover Boss. Really? Yeah. Okay. We just signed the lease this week. His name is David Seelinger, and uh, he's got a company that is in the limousine business. They've got 700 locations, and he just signed a lease uh, with us in a building that's right near O'Hare Airport. He couldn't find any, anything else near O'Hare because the market is so tight. Yeah. Everybody wants industrial. Industrial is so hot right now. Interesting. Uh, when I started, nobody even knew what it was. I'd say I'm in industrial real estate and people would say, what's that? Yeah, that's a thing. Okay. Right. Industrial what? Well, I mean, you, you, you look at, you, you look at the sexy a asset classes and, you know, if you go on any of the websites or you're looking at YouTube or, you know, it's, it's all self storage and mobile home parks. And, uh, you know, I, I met a gentleman and I, I was blown away by his, um, by his uh, earnings claims that, you know, RV parks, uh, as well as, you know, obviously multifamily, which is where I live. And, you know, so people don't necessarily look at, you know, I mean, office, like, for instance, here in, in New England, where I am in Connecticut, you know, office space has been really beaten down. And in fact, I'm seeing more plays in terms of office conversions to multifamily uh, than than ever before. And, you know, the, the industrial, uh, you know, I, I couldn't tell you the last time I drove through an industrial park, but 
uh, I, the last time I did, I'm, I'm thinking in my mind's eye that, cause I was going to visit my uncle who was a CEO of a manufacturing company. Uh, the whole, the whole place was chuck full of human beings and, uh, and, and, uh, machinery. So, um, but that was, you know, a couple of years ago, but still. Yeah. That's the beauty of industrial. Uh, you can't work from home if you're in a manufacturing right. or distrib distribution business. Right, exactly. Because the product has to, they it comes in a dock. The most important thing in an industrial building is having loading docks that have good maneuvering room for the truck so that they can back in these big over the road uh, trailers. They need, they need the maneuvering area to back in. So if I have a building that's got good truck docks, that's in a good location and my tenant were to leave, I would have five, seven offers for purchase within a matter of, of weeks mm -hmm. and all to companies that have employees that have to come to work because right. these machines need people to, to work at them. Yep. And then the, the tables where they, where they do the assembly, we've got a building and we're, we're actually raising money for it right now. Um, which is interesting. We only have one right now. Uh, and it's, it's in the city of Chicago in a great neighborhood where the firemen and policemen have to live. Mm -hmm. They, they have to live in the city. Right. And it's like the best neighborhood. And there's an industrial park hidden away in the neighborhood with 11 buildings. And we owned one since uh, 2002. And this other one came available, a family that owned a business, sold the business, and they kept the building and they leased the building back to the company that bought them out. Now, this is a company that manufactures products for the welding industry. It, okay. it's a, they Safety products for the welding industry. Yeah. They were bought out. Serious niche. Serious niche. They were bought out by a uh, company called Bunzel, B-U-N-Z-L. Yeah, I'm sure I know them. Up. $12 yep. billion dollar company on the London Stock Exchange. They yep. own about 70 companies in the United States. So um, we're raising money for that. We bought the building from this family. The 88-year-old the patriarch, the father, just wanted to get it out of his estate. He didn't want to leave it to his kids. They don't know anything about real estate. Right. So I knew him, and I'll, I said, I'll buy it. So we get an 8% return, but there's only two years left on the lease. So my risk is they leave. Right. But they're not going to leave. They've been there since 1995. They renew, they've they renewed the lease four times in the last 12 years. Yeah. They're not leaving. Thoughts. Yeah. So, so, yeah, it's amazing. It's an amazing, like, just anecdotal story of the kind of buildings we get involved in. Yeah. So, so I'm curious, you know, and, and I, you know, we have our process in terms of how we, evaluate a, a, a target geography and then how we go into, you know, the various neighborhoods and figure out if, if a building is a good fit. What is your approach? Like, how do you figure, like, what are you looking for in a target geography? Let's start there and then we'll drill down. Okay. So every city has their geographic elements that never change. It's yep. always the same. If you, if you were in Chicago or LA or Hartford, 30 years ago, and you came back, you'd say, I recognize what's here. This is the same. Some neighborhoods change dramatically. Some don't. Right. We want to be in the path of good change. Yeah. And by, with our hyper focus, we can see where that is. So, so how do you define good change? Um, primarily neighborhood. Uh, unfortunately, it's, it's not good for the people who live there now. Gentrification. Okay. When, when new homes are built there and executives live there and they build workforce housing not too far away. Right. An example of one, there, we have a market here that used to be the meat cutting market. It was, it's called the Fulton Market and it's just yeah, sure. west of downtown. Yep. Allegedly like the fastest growing market in the country. Really? Oh, so okay. in 2008, um, right before everything went bad, uh, a broker brought me a deal. She had cold called and found this deal where the company was an ink company looking to get out of a 30,000 foot building in the Fulton market. It was a dirty building. I went and looked at it. No joke. There were condoms, used condoms on the sidewalk, hypodermic needles in the grass. So a real class A neighborhood. Yeah, it was rough. It was rough. And the the biggest problem of all was um, the neighborhood was scary. Yeah, 
And I said to my partners and, and to my investors, I said, I found a deal and I don't, I just have this gut feeling that the area around it's going to get better. And it was the uh, one block west of the Fulton Market where today there are office buildings that are being filled up even in a bad office market. It's where everybody, McDonald's has their headquarters, Mondelez, yep. Google, Chicago headquarters, retail restaurants. So I said, one day this area is going to be good. And I was very lucky because three years later, it started to turn really good. So, so yeah. yeah, so I'm curious, what made that, I mean, obviously gentrification is the answer to, at a high level, but was there a city plan? Was there, what What tipped you off that, that you know, what gave you that that feeling that something was gonna, about to change? Well, I know the Chicago market, this hyper-focus that I have, I know it so well. Yeah. And the broker had a husband who happens to be my cousin. They had a building five blocks east, and he was keeping his eye on what was happening to the zoning and to the neighborhood. Okay. He told me, he said, my building that I bought for 250000 Joel, is going to be worth $12 million in 10 years. And I said, Donald, that's stupid. Guess what? It is. Everything's being built around him, and he's still got this scrap metal, crappy place yeah. that he's holding out on, and it's worth $12 million, and he paid nothing for it right so i said you know what maybe cousin donald's right and i knew the area so well because I, I know the whole I, when i started working for milt Podowski, i went cold calling all over the whole chicago area right. I, I have a trick that i do at weddings if i'm sitting next to someone and they say what business they're in i say what town you in elk grove village what what do you do oh we're in the uh business of doing hoses for uh hvac equipment Right. Oh, are you at 1001 Morse, the 30,000 square foot building on the corner of Lively and Morse? And they look at me and they go, you following me? Yeah. No, no it just turns out that you're a savant. <laughs> you get savant. I know the market so well. So yeah. cousin Donald walked me around the neighborhood. He says, this is about to go here. This right. is about to go here. And I called my investors and I said, it's not a hunch. It's truly a belief. Right that this area is going to get better. So we leased it to the U S postal service as a warehouse. Okay. We got $7 a foot net. They pay the taxes, insurance, maintenance, and utilities. Yeah. And last year we renewed their lease for $19 a square foot. Wow. Congratulations. That's a home so, run. Okay. So now I'll tell you about the deal where I bought a piece of land. Cause I thought I was going to become a retail developer. Yep. We put three million dollars into it, and eleven years later, we lost all three million over oh. that period of time. So again, now that taught me the lesson: don't do land, right? Don't stick be a developer. Land. Don't right. do retail. Stick with industrial. You know the area so well, right. right? So, not every deal is a home run, but when one is, boy, it just feels so good. <laughs> it's hey, I'll I'll take single after single after single. I'm okay with that. A lot right. of luck. A lot of luck yeah. involved in that. Yeah, true. But I mean, not every deal has to be a home run is my point is, you know, right. it's, it, I, I'm more than happy, you know, as long as, it, and again, I'm going back to multifamily world, but, you know, as long as the building cash flows and, you know, we have a, a modicum of stability in the, in the resident population, um, you know, the things that we do to, uh, to retain those people and to make that building clean and safe, and then ultimately beautiful that they're proud to live in it. Um, you know, we, we execute same thing. We execute the exact same building, uh, um, plan with every property we own, every single one, rinse and repeat, rinse and repeat, rinse and repeat. I'm fine with singles and doubles. Yeah. And I'm jealous of what you do because I have a lot of friends who are in multifamily. They've all done so well because multifamily is needed. You know, there's a, yeah. there's a housing shortage. Sure. And everybody needs a place to live. And you also can put debt on in a way that I can't. Right. Right. I mean, yeah, you've, but, you've, got, you've got such an advantage in terms of how you can use leverage. Yeah. But even, even so, I mean, we're, we're reticent to, to do a lot of debt also, because, you know, the thing that I've seen happen with a lot of our, my peer group is uh, that they have rushed into deals. They've put bridge debt on these deals uh, and, you know, as we were talking before I hit record, 
you know, I, I've seen at least one version of, of this story that uh, 23% of the arms that are maturing this year will not be renewed because they will not cash flow. They won't, they won't um, cash out. And yeah. it's, uh, you know, that balloon you're talking about that's about to pop, I, I suspect it's already popped and the air is just starting to leak out and there are a whole bunch of dead men walking and they don't know they're dead yet. Yeah, I, I've been watching uh, the economists and what they have to say. Me too. So there's a great um, podcast. It's called Wealthy On. Oh, I don't know that one. I'm going to read it. W E A L T H I O N. And okay. the host is a fellow named Adam Taggart. And he interviews these fascinating economists. And they talk a lot about the macro economy. Uh, and, and it's fascinating. And I also am a Fed watcher. I, I watched uh, Jerome Powell being interviewed by David Rubenstein a few weeks ago. And yep. what what uh, you and I have discussed this, what what um, Powell's doing is he's hell bent on getting inflation down to 2%. And if he has to crash the economy to do it, he's going to do it. And I believe that there will be a lot of eggs broken on the way to that. You bet. Using your term. Yeah. yeah. You bet. There's no other way to do it. There's no such thing. I, I when people talk about a soft landing, I I kind of roll my eyes. I don't know what that looks like. Yeah, I don't either. It may, I hope that it's a soft landing, but I can't see it. The first one in my lifetime, and I'm 53. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I've, I've seen four down cycles, and we haven't seen one really yet. Right. So, in, in, since 2008, I, I'm I'm a strong believer uh, in just super safety my investors are are really smart and they're very cautious yeah and this no debt all cash thing is what a lot of them are are gravitating toward because they are afraid the economy is going to crash and where else can you put your money in a hard asset where the bank's not going to come and take it away from you right there Absolutely. is no bank yeah i don't know if you've ever seen workout people but the bank, I had seven banks in 2008 that I owed money to for 50 properties. And if you have one bank that has five properties and one property goes into workout, they put your relationship in workout. Sure. The good buildings go into workout and they become at risk because the loan documents, if you read them, say, if you're in default on one, we can put you in default on all. So I read these loan documents. I've, I've signed hundreds of them over the yeah. year. Not anymore, but I, I, I know them. There's something called Laser Pro documents that all the, all the banks use. And yeah. I know all of the things that can nail you. Yeah. The thing that nails you the most <clears throat> is the attitude of people who work in the workout department. These are people who, if they didn't work in the workout department, would become police that beat people up or military people that go into villages and kill people. Right. These people are out for blood. They are nasty. Something about them. They want, they, they, Joel, we're going to take you down. You owe us money on one deal. It's bad. We're going to take you down on all five other ones. It's right. like, are you getting joy out yeah, it's of blood sport? Right. It is. So I have no bank. I, I I'm just sick of that. You know, that, that can't happen again. I can't let that happen to my investors or to me. And in your business, I think it'll happen a lot less because of the multifamily multi-tenant situation compared to my single tenants so i i almost have to do this kind of deal in order to sleep at night yeah no i hear you i i i i'm not sure i quite agree with the whole premise in that i think there are a lot of people who took way more risk than they understood they took and i think those are the ones that are going to uh have a real problem particularly this year and next year and the you know i i think that when you're beholden to 80% loan to value, uh, it gets, and your, your, you know, your valuations start to drop, uh, and your business model has assumed that your rents were going to continue to go up at three to 6% a year, and that the valuation and your NOI was going to continue to grow, and that you were going to find a way to manage expenses down to, you know, just to inflation levels of 2%, when in reality, it's seven and a half, uh, you're in a lot of trouble. Yeah, the bank's your boss. My my lawyer told me that the bank <clears throat> always wins. The bank always wins. Always. And uh, it's a form of slavery. Yeah. It really is. They are your boss. 
that you have no say. They don't even pay you. They just tell right. you what to do and you have yep. to do it. Or, or, or right. Yeah. Or they come after you and try to foreclose. So, right. yeah, I, I, uh, I, I can't tell you how surprised I was at how many investors like this all cash, no mortgage thing after my accountant told me no one would ever do it. You know, it's, it's an interesting, it's a fascinating idea because, you know, I look at, you know, I look at various different asset classes in, in, in different ways from a risk profile and I'm very conservative. Uh, you know, you look at um, industrial, you know, what I put for me, cause I'm, I'm not a billionaire, right. I'm still looking to, I'm looking for growth, not necessarily preserve. I'm looking for a balance of growth and preservation, but I'm more tilted towards growth. Um, however, you know, the thing that I don't believe in is the stock market, although I do have a little bit of money in the stock market, but not as much as I did 12, 15 years ago, and by percentage at least. And the, you know, the fact is, is that diversifying into, you know, a product like yours, uh, you know, makes a lot of sense to me in that if I had 25% of my net worth in a in an asset that, you know, was going to trudge along at six, seven, eight, nine percent like clockwork, and it's tied to a a, a real asset, tangible asset, uh, not named gold. Um, <laughs> that you know Which that's all time low yesterday. Uh, not <laughs> all right. time since all time this year low. Yeah. yeah. Uh, well done, fantastic. You know, it's it's interesting to me from a cap preservation perspective you know, to look at this kind of asset class. And it was one of the reasons why I was so excited that you agreed to come on onto the show because it's uh you know, it's a, it's a really unique, um, it's a unique asset class, but it's also a very unique approach to what could be a very risky asset class. And I've always, until you and I really started to get to know one another, I, I thought it was really risky, you know, single tenant, single tenant, anything makes me nervous. Right. But, you know, the fact is, is that they're, you know, it's not as easy. It's a lot harder to move, you know, a couple of metric tons of, of manufacturing equipment uh, rather than, you know, packing up a house and moving. Right. So, you know, entirely different model. And uh, so I, I appreciate um, the space that you occupy. And, and also, I really respect uh, how you um, approach the asset class and, and how you manage your investors money. Uh, it's really impressive, and and uh, I have a lot of respect for how you operate. So I'm glad we were able to talk today. Ditto. Thank you. Um, so Joel, I'm curious. You know, when you're not uh, out there buying up as many industrial uh, buildings as you possibly can, what do you like to do for fun? I do two things. Um, I have two grandchildren, two granddaughters, four and one. My wife and I do a lot of hanging out with them. They're local, which is yeah, great. that's wonderful. And one on the way. Uh, Congrats. Thank you. And um, I also love to travel and I like warm weather. Chicago's not that. No. So we just got back from nine days in Panama. We, we were on a private island. It was the Beautiful. coolest thing ever. Oh, it was great. And Panama City and the Panama Canal are so cool. It's amazing. Yeah. yeah. And then my uh, son and I uh, went on an investor dinner and lunch tour in Florida. We were there for four weeks and saw 17 of our investors and we bought dinner. <laughs> it was great. Yeah. Great time. Excellent. Oh, that's fantastic. Um, so Joel, thank you so much for your time today. I really enjoyed it. I found it really educational. Um, like I said, before we started recording, you know, one of the cool things about having a podcast is I get to, I get to meet people who are a whole lot smarter than I am in, in their particular part of the world. And, um, so I really appreciate the, uh, the education, and I'm sure our audience will as well. If if someone wants to get a hold of you or learn more about, um, you know, you or one of your upcoming projects, you know, what are the best ways to get a hold of you? Sure. Uh, our website is Brit Properties, B-R-I-T, one T, properties.com. And on our website, uh, there's a very interesting article that goes along with where we have our offerings on the offering page called Why You Should Not Invest With Us. And it's the 10 questions inside of an article that if I were the most brilliant investor investing in someone else's deal, these are the questions I would ask. Right. So. Uh, That's really good. Yeah. I'm, I may, uh, I don't know that I've seen that video, but I'm, I'm going to watch it today for sure. Yeah. That's uh, an art. It's just a written article. Oh, it's an article. Well, then yeah. I'm going to be reading it tonight. So even yeah. Better. So it's, it's, it's very funny. <laughs> it's like, <a> yeah. <laughs> Well, Joel, Joel Friedland from uh, Brit Properties, thank you so much for your time today. It's a pleasure to see you, sir. 
and uh, I wish you continued success and, um, and uh, yeah, good luck. Thanks, Ed. Thank you so much. Now, actually, one one other question I have, I forgot to ask. Are you a, a Cubbies fan or a White Sox fan? Cubs all the way. My all right. Because it's religion the there. My neighbor across the street owns the store across from Wrigley Field where they sell the hats and the uniforms and all this yep. stuff. Yeah. And uh, I, we love the Cubs. We're, yeah. Cub, we're Cub fans all the way. Are you are you a Chicago fan at all? In any way? Uh, so I, I so I'm a Boston Red Sox fan. So I always had an affinity to the Cub fans because we shared that you know eighty something years of failure together. You know yeah. you with you with your Billy Goat uh, curse and me with my you know curse of the babe. So yeah, I've always felt an affinity for the Cubs. Yeah. But uh, yeah, so it's uh, I'm actually going to be in Chicago this summer. But I'll talk to you about that offline. Please do. Thank yeah. You. All right, Joel. Thank you so much. It's really good to see you. This has been the Real Estate Underground Podcast, a Clark Street Capital presentation. Thanks for joining us. If you're enjoying the show, please remember to subscribe and share it with your friends. If you'd like to learn more about Clark Street Capital and our upcoming projects, please join our investor club at clarkst.com slash join. Until next time, happy investing. This has been the Real Estate Underground. Don't forget to subscribe. It helps us grow. Until next time, undergrounders, remember your real estate journey begins with a simple step forward. Now get to it. Bye for now.